So good afternoon. Good evening. Good afternoon. Honorable Professor G. D. Sharma, sir, the esteemed Vice Chancellor of the University of Science and Technology, Meghalaya, and Vice President AIU, Dr. Pankaj Mittal, Madam, esteemed Secretary General AIU, Dr. Dia Dutt, Advisor Association of Indian Universities, distinguished speakers of today's webinar, Dr. Shubhra Dutta from Elsevier and Dr. Varun Majumdar from MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Esteemed Vice Chancellors, Directors, Deans, and other faculty members who have logged on to the program today, I extend you a good evening as well as a warm welcome to this webinar on internationalization. Let me give a bold statement that uh, amongst lots of changes we have witnessed in the field, uh, all the fields like economics, politics, and the science, and all other industry, all fields, higher education has witnessed a massive revolution, massive changes in the entire world. If you look at the larger canvas of higher education, the internationalization of higher education has become one of the very, very vital component. And internationalization plays a major role because we are in the 21st century and 21st century itself is characterized as the century of knowledge, knowledge economy, knowledge industry, and everything is revolving around creation, dissemination, and, and utilization of knowledge for the larger benefit of the society. And in the process of creation of knowledge, distribution of knowledge and utilization of knowledge for the societal welfare, networking, collaboration is very, very important. Today, we are in a multipolar world, multiculturalism, diversity, inclusion. These are some of the words we are discussing. And if you look at the benefits of internationalization, I do not uh, need to overemphasize, but of course it leads to improving the academic quality, internationally oriented student staff, and it increases national and international visibility of the institutions. And it also contributes to enhance the institutional strength through strategic partnership to mobilize and leverage the internal and intellectual resources. Economic gain is one of the important dimension which cannot be uh, neglected, which cannot be overlooked. Or universalization of knowledge resources is one of the most important and key factor for the internationalization of higher education. The practice of internationalization fosters an immersive and inclusive academic environment. It goes beyond the recognizing the fact that international uh, students' culture is uh, to be emerged and they have to be a, a developed into the global leadership and global citizenship. So therefore, collaboration and the networking has become very, very important today. And uh, therefore, under the banner of INHI, a consortium, Indian Network for Internationalization of Higher Education, a path-breaking initiative uh, taken by Association of Indian Universities in the direction of promoting the internationalization of higher education. So under this INHI consortium, uh, we have been systematically trying to create some of the knowledge resources, important knowledge resources, a repository of knowledge resources, which will be uploaded in AI website that will be giving some handholding and some, some insight rather to the university community, those who are at the helm of affairs in dealing with the internationalization. So today, yet another important and a subject of cardinal importance, this is international collaboration, especially in the context of research, research networking, collaboration. Uh, this subject today has been decided for the deliberation and we have two important speakers. The details about the speakers will be uh, explained and introduced. The speaker's profile will be introduced later by Dr. Dia. I will be requesting her. But before uh, moving forward, I request Honorable Secretary General Madam, uh, Dr. Pankaj Mittal to share the introductory remarks. And I don't think I need to introduce Dr. Pankaj Mittal. She is one of the veteran in higher education sector with more than 30, 35 years of experience and uh, working in a different kind of organizations. Madam has dealt uh, higher education for, for a long uh, time and having massive experience in this area. She is a Fulbrighter. And Madam is the, Madam Dr. Mittal is the second secretary general 
uh, women secretary general in AIU in its long history. That's really a distinct credit. But let me keep this introduction of Madam. She's very popular in the higher education sector of India, especially known internationally. But she is very popular in Indian higher education system. I do not think anybody who has logged into this must not be knowing Madam. I don't think so. Keeping her introduction shortcut, I request Madam to kindly share your words with us. Thank you, Dr. Pani, for your kind words. Uh, a very warm welcome to you. A very good evening to all of you. And thanks for joining this particular webinar because this is important for us that you are here. Because as you all know, Association of Indian Universities, which is the largest network of universities in the world, we have a membership base of 942 universities, which is almost 95% of the Indian universities. So 942 Indian universities are the members of Indian as well as some foreign universities are the members of AIU. And AIU, you know, that is working with the central government for implementing many, many schemes of uh, central government, including national education policy. So when this national education policy was launched, we took it upon ourselves that the policy is being given by the government of India. Regulations are being issued by the government, uh, by the University Grants Commission, but handholding the universities in terms of, say, I mean, sometimes I say like a father, UGC is regulating the universities, maintaining the discipline, issuing regulations. But as a mother, we are handholding the universities, assisting the universities, helping the universities and taking it forward. So to implement whatever is being issued under NEP, to implement the regulations being issued by the University Grants Commission, AIU as the largest university members association of the world is taking all possible steps to help the universities in implementing the recommendations of NEP. Now you all know that one of the major recommendations of national education policy is promoting internationalization in higher education. I don't think there has been any other policy which has been which has given so much of impetus to internationalization of higher education as this policy with the uh, foreign universities being allowed to set up campuses in India, our university is going abroad, credit transfer, joint degrees, dual degrees, India, uh, international students office in India. So like many, many recommendations there are there in national education policy. So therefore, we also felt that as a university body, as a university association, we should be helping our universities in promoting internationalization. And what we did was that because we hold many vice chancellors conference in which we keep on meeting many vice chancellors. So many of the vice chancellors themselves confess that we want to do internationalization. We are wanting to do internationalization. We have a very strong intent to do internationalization, but we don't know how to go about it, how to start, whom to partner with, whom to talk to, how to start this process even, how to establish an international students office, how to enter into partnerships, which universities to choose as a collaborator or as a partner institution. So when we heard all that, we thought that again to help our university, especially the, those who have the intent but not the know-how on how to do internationalization, we established this network, Indian Network of International Higher Education. And you will be surprised that almost every country has a network of international higher education. But India being the largest higher education system of the world, doesn't have a network of international higher educators. So again, AIU established an Indian network of international higher educators. In week short, we call it INHI. If you go to AIU website, AIU.ac.in, you will see that INHI. So I also request all of you to become a member of INHI because if you want to really have advantage or take the benefits of the uh, programs we are doing through INHI, please become a member of INHI as soon as possible. Right now it is free of cost. Slowly, slowly when we build up, we will think of putting a cost, but right now it is free of cost. So it is the best opportunity to become a member of INHI, to do become a member of INHI. And under this INHI, we are running many, many programs. For example, last month, again, I, I must thank Dia if she is here. Dia, she, she, she is now advising AIU and she was a Dia is there, there now. Dia is uh, advising AIU. She's an advisor with AIU and formerly she was with Yusuf as a deputy director. So she is helping us in many of the programs of AIU. And last month we held a program for our universities, which again was very much like program, which is, I mean, we got a very good feedback in which 
we spoke to the universities about how to establish an international students office because a direction has come that I'll establish your office but how to establish it what will be the purpose what will be the size what will be the work what will be the objectives how he'll be it will be helping the university students who are enrolled as international students or how it will even help in getting international students so all that was discussed in the last webinar we are putting the uh, recordings of all the webinars on the website of aiu so that you can be hearing it even if you miss it out and similarly today's webinar we again have two very very eminent experts we had dr varun majumdar he is from mit and uh, dr shubhra datta who is from xavier and they are going to talk about the partnerships last time we talked about international students of today they will talk about the partnerships how to forge high impact partnership research partnerships how to identify good collaborators how to identify partner institutions how to go about it so sort of a step by step guide on how to enter into partnerships will be discussed by both of our eminent experts i i'm sure that you will enjoy the webinar and we will be having again a very very positive feedback about this webinar and we'll keep on doing these webinars tomorrow also there is a webinar through edify online and that particular webinar i am telling it here again because i want all of you to be there tomorrow itself tomorrow also at four o'clock in that webinar we are partnered with edify online which is a us based company in which they are telling you how to get international experts to your university for lectures or online or physical or whatever mode so identifying an international faculty to be on your uh, campus that is what we are going to discuss tomorrow so that again is very very important aspect of internationalization of higher education so keep attending keep enjoying keep learning keep promoting internationalization of higher education in your institutions so thank you very much for joining over to dr pani please madam thank you so much for giving an excellent background and putting the things very succinctly and briefly about the multi pronged strategy adopted by association of indian universities in the direction of promoting the internationalization of higher education let me simultaneously welcome our international partner dr dhruv banerji from from project set who has been helping us supporting us in organizing anveshan one of the marvelous activity on promoting the research in india indians among the indian higher education institutions so having said so may i request professor gd sharma sir but before before i request professor gd sharma sir i can just summarize one or two points given by madam that was very important for our audience to know that madam has very succinctly explained that association of indian university is one of the oldest body we have three distinct features that makes us totally distinguished from other associations of the world that is number one aiu has the vast network of universities in the world no such association exists ever in the world which is having a large network of universities of 1000 universities under its portal number one number two aiu is such an organization which was established right after the establishment of Association of Commonwealth Universities, which was established in 1913, and the second university was association in the world was AIU, that was established in 1925. The third distinct characteristic that makes AIU is a different organization. That is, it's an organization, it's an association that caters to the need of educational need of a whole range of stakeholders, starting from the student to up to the level of a governor, chancellor, and vice chancellors. So this is the distinct part. Having said so, honourable. vice president of GD, uh, association of indian universities professor gd sharma is vice chancellor of university of science and technology most of uh, the audience logged on today might be knowing him definitely uh, professor sharma is a veteran educationist a seasoned academic administrator and he belongs to uh, the subject of vice science and because of his seniority as the second senior most vice chancellor of our country he holds the position of vice president of aiu sir has lots of achievements wherever he has gone wherever he has walked he has brought laurels for the university with this small and brief introduction i would request humbly professor gd sharma sir to please bless us with his wisdom thank you very much uh, dr pani and uh, uh, good evening to every one of you and dr pankaj mittal secretary general of association of indian universities has already given in brief the role of aiu particularly in providing 
the facilities and also providing the opportunities to the higher educational system for establishing the infrastructural role, particularly related to the higher education and how the collaborations can be more successful and mainly to enhance the quality of higher education as per NEP 2020, so that universities, colleges, and also institutes of higher learnings can also emerge as the center internationally recognized center of excellence. That is the purpose. And in this series, number of uh, webinars have been organized. Not taking much time because we, we are having only one hour time. To, so let us uh, go straight away to the today's topic. We have two experts, both from India as well as uh, from abroad from USA. And uh, they are representing two broad area, uh, biotechnology, that is life science and the physical science, the physics, so that uh, they can give how the international collaboration can further be initiated, enhanced and strengthened in different universities. It may vary from individual to individual, department to department or university to university. As has been mentioned by Madam Pankaj Mittal, that it may be institutional or campus establishment or without campus also through taking joint project or inviting experts to our institutional areas of uh, some of the their expertise <coughs> area or also from India, how we can provide support and guidance to those who want to go abroad for higher studies or to those students who are interested to have uh, now joint degree or dual degree or uh, collaboration. So since these opportunities are available, we have to also careful that these opportunities are helpful in giving proper guidance. So uh, with this uh, few uh, suggestions made by our uh, Honorable uh, Pankaj, Dr. Pankaj Mittalji, I extend a very warm welcome to Dr. Subra Datta, Research Solution Consultant elsewhere, posted at Gurgaon, Haryana, and Dr. Barun Majumdar, Data Analyst, Coach Institute of Integrative Cancer Research, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Cambridge, USA. With their wider experience and their very high quality research, it will be good for all of us to seek their very, very informative been pointed as well as a experienced adv advice that how we can go for this uh, collaboration, which will be creating further uh, facilities for establishing international collaboration at institutional level. So thank you very much. And uh, I once again extend very warm welcome to both the speakers of today's webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Over Honorable Sir. Thank you, Honorable Sir, for your gracious presence. And your presence has certainly art, color, and grace to the occasion and event today. Thank you, sir, so much for this word of wisdom. And with this and making the process certain, I request Dr. Diyadat, the, the present advisor to AIU. Uh, Madam, to introduce our speaker and to start the proceedings. And before that, Madam Dr. Mittal has already uh, announced that Dr. Dia superannuated from a senior position from United States Education Foundation of India. It's in an abbreviated form. It is called at UCP. This is one of uh, the vibrant organizations of the U.S. government that is providing the uh, services to uh, the academic community. 
So I request Dr. Dia, Madam, to kindly introduce our speakers. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Pani. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, before I uh, introduce the two speakers for this afternoon, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Mittal and you know AIU for giving me this opportunity to you know make a very humble contribution to the education sector in India. This is indeed has been a worthwhile culmination of my nearly three decades of you know, experience uh, of working uh, in the education sector in US and India. So thank you, Dr. Mittal, for this opportunity. Uh, you know, it just came at the right time. Uh, let me uh, introduce uh, both uh, uh, Dr. Shubhra and uh, later on Dr. Barun. Dr. Shubhra, I've had the distinct uh, privilege of working with her earlier on two occasions and the impact of her presentation was literally mind blowing. So I saved her contact, you know, and knew that I would definitely need her for my future, you know, endeavors. So Dr. Shubra, as mentioned, is a research solutions consultant with Elsevier. She has a master's in biotechnology from IIT Roorkee and PhD from JNU. Uh, at Elsevier, she's supporting researchers and institutes in the quest for research excellence. She has diverse work experience from teaching and research in academia to research, consulting, and strategic business development in corporate sector. So uh, with this, uh, Dr. Shubra, I uh, welcome you. Uh, I'm really looking forward to your presentation and over to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Dia, for the warm welcome. So a uh, very good evening to all our participants here, to all the dignitaries and vice chancellors. First of all, I would like to congratulate AIU on the wonderful initiative of INI. I think that's a, a great initiative which will help and uh, boost the efforts of our Indian universities. Um, many, many thanks to Dr. Pankaj Mittal and Dr. Pani for giving me the opportunity to be part of this wonderful program. So without much ado, I will get into the presentation. So let me just start with sharing my screen. Give me a moment. Dr. Dia, please let me know if it is visible to you. Yes, yes, Dr. It's Shubra, visible. it's quite yeah. visible. visible. Thank you, Dr. Pani. It's visible. So today I begin over here and talking about how to create high impact research collaborations. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Pani did mention in his opening yes. remarks that uh, mm -hmm. with the help of, uh, you know, greater international collaborations, we not only uh, improve on the quality of the overall research that we are doing, but also the visibility of our research in the rest of the world. And which is very important if we want to place ourselves as the leading you knowledge want, power, knowledge seminar? economy. Interest seminar collaboration. So let me just give you some figures, uh, which I think you may be quite familiar Shubra, with. Dr. So right Shubra, now we are having kind of a 3.8. Just one second. One second. Oh, yes. Yes, sir. Honorable members, may I request you to kindly keep your phone on uh, microphone on switched off mode. It should not create any background knowledge. And moreover, I suggest we should maintain some uh, decorum, some etiquettes of online meetings. I request you to please keep your microphone on switched off mode. Thank you so much. Over to Dr. Shubra. Thank you, sir. So let me just give you some numbers over here. Probably. Uh, we have a lot of vice chancellors over here, top management of the universities. You're already familiar with it. So currently we have some 3.8 crore students, roughly, out of which 4 lakh researchers are there who are currently within uh, the 1,000 universities, 1,000 odd universities in the country, as well as 57,000 colleges. Our overall research spending is uh, pretty meager, below 1%. It's almost at 0.7% of our GDP. Now we have to understand that the distribution of these researchers, the colleges is also very unequal uh, given the geography that we are in. Some places are more accessible than the others. Something is rural, something is urban, right? The quality of student coming in, uh, not be it in, in terms of not only talent, but uh, 
the, I would say the paying, the economic status is also very different. So there's a lot of inequality and that's why NEP promotes collaboration so that we are able to work across these uh, inequalities and come across as a knowledge superpower. And it will always be helpful if we look outside the country also to take help and utilize their expertise to improve on our research ecosystem. Uh, you must have seen this news report which came out recently uh, in March itself that India right now is in world's uh, fourth number in terms of research publication, but it ranks ninth in citations. That means we are definitely improving on the quantity of research we are uh, publishing, but we need to work simultaneously with improving on the quality of the research as well. What's the most interesting part is the graph that you see over here is that the growth in the Indian publishing of research output has been consistent and growing over the past couple of years. So past five years, if you see, our CAGR is at 11.2%, which is a heartening thing that, of course, we are there in the right direction. It's just that we have to keep monitoring the quality also in a much more stringent uh, manner. Given today, if we look at it, um, since after March, they took at the uh, complete year till 2021. If we look at the publication status till date, as in including 2023, India is already at number three. But the number between us at number three and US at number two is quite big. So uh, we need to plan diligently, all the universities need to plan diligently if we want to move ahead in this road to excellence. If you look at the collaborations happening between various countries, if so this is a collaboration map of uh, the various countries which are uh, research intensive. Now you will see that the thick lines, these thick lines which showcase stronger collaborations are directed from the developed nations outwards. So US, UK, Canada, Germany, France, Australia, you see most of the thick lines are originating from here and going outside, which is the worldview of collaborations that uh, majorly the developing countries are the ones which are the drivers of this collaboration. But uh, countries like India, uh, South Africa, Brazil, etc., are also participating and our contributors, so which is a good, good sign. And we should continue to keep doing it. If we look at the Indian scenario, overall Indian scenario, then international collaboration coming out from India stands at 21%, which is a decent enough number. Now you will see the quality of the research, how it changes drastically. Now, if I compare with national collaboration, that is within the country, national collaboration is somewhere around 30%. Institutional collaboration is 43%, close to half. Institution is within the same institute. Now, this is one, uh, I would say, trend that we need to work, that people come out of the comfort zone, that we need to work within our institute only, but also step out and look for more fruitful collaborations outside the institute as well. So if you look at institutional collaboration, uh, it's at 43%, I've already told you, but let's look at the quality of it. So if you look at the FWCI, which is the normalized metric for assessment of the research output, which is known as the field weighted citation impact, for institutional collaboration, it stands at 0.78, wherein the world average is at one. So anything above one is above the world average performance. Anything below one is, of course, not so good and below the world perform world average performance. So institutional performance collaboration for India is at 0.78. It increases marginally to 0.89 when we go get into national collaboration. So collaboration does help in bringing the better out of each other. But international collaboration, if you would see, the FWCI rises significantly to 1.66. So this way, we are able to harness and work 
uh, and benefit from the expertise available from various research groups. If we look at the collaboration map, then we have like 48 countries we are working with in the Asia Pacific region, uh, 47 in the European region, uh, 31 in the North America. So more or less, it is equally spread out our collaborations. Although the number of countries we are collaborating is higher in South uh, Asia Pacific, but the number of institutions we are working on is highest in US, UK. So overall, if you see the list of countries in this list, these are, are the top collaborating countries for India. So overall, if you see, we are also driving our collaborations with the developed nations more so right but we have countries uh, over here we have uh, malaysia also figuring in in number 10 so this is an interesting aspect i would say uh, because countries developing countries uh, which match in profile or their needs to us can form partners who have the same goals right we both have to ha find a uh, fight against let's say clean water clean energy we are fighting the same game so uh, it will be interesting if and how we can drive our collaboration with the developing nations as well, because together we can grow much, much uh, faster. If we look at, this was at the country level, if we look at, uh, at institutional level, our collaborations. Now over here, this shows all institutes, be it from India or from outside, who are all into international collaboration, the maximum. What I see over here is that the uh, maximum collaboration is driven by the tech institutes or technology universities, right? So people who are more into engineering and technology, they are driving the collaborations. One reason could be because maximum publications are happening in this area. And of course, uh, the view of uh, social sciences would be quite limited. So it'll be interesting to view how much work is going on in the other sectors as well. Now, if you look at overall, look at the, because I talked to you about uh, the tech is leading it. So let's see uh, which all areas is India collaborating in. So this is a, a sort of a wheel of various subject areas. So we see a lot of concentration of color uh, somewhere here, bluish, purplish color. This is much more dense. Uh, and then the next color that we see is red. So this blue, a violet color is for engineering and technology. The red is for medicine. The yellow over here, the sparse yellow over here is for social sciences. So we do have collaboration, international collaboration in social sciences as well, but uh, the more intense uh, partnerships are here in the area of technology and as well as medicines also. So this is overall research area that we are looking at. If I look at only at the new topics which have emerged in the last three years, because this is overall partnerships we are looking at. What about last three years? What all areas have been our focus? India specific, I'm looking at. Uh, so over here, interestingly, the red part is dominant. That is medicine. But then that makes sense because you could relate it because last three years we have been affected by the COVID pandemic. So maximum research will be happening and also collaborations uh, correspondingly uh, would happen in the area of medicine. But interestingly, if we dive down into the top topics uh, where people are working, these are broader areas we are looking at, medicine we are leading. Uh, but if I look at the top topics, then we have quite a mix. So we have collaboration topics where India is working on is uh, data mining, which is of course the next uh, big thing. Then online courses, blended learning, because COVID made us realize that uh, this is the next mode of learning, next wave of learning. And thanks to that, today we are having this hybrid session. Also, we are able to connect with so many um, vice chancellors today over here and also computer aided instruction. So it's very interesting to know that the mix, although 
uh, would look like that it's only in one particular topic that we are leading, but there are other topics also which have come up in the last three years, which are important for our Indian academia. Going forward, if we want to drive collaboration in a particular area, first thing I would say is look for the topics which are our strengths. What is our strength by which value I can bring on table? See, one thing is uh, collaboration can be driven by the fact that I have, a, I have a good reputation in market. So people know this university has a good research credibility and everybody be, would be open to having a collaboration. What if we have not proved ourselves like that? We do not have, we have not established our uh, reputation as such globally because it's quite difficult, right? coming from India to have an established reputation globally. In that case, look for topics for, in which we have our upper hand, which are our strengths, wherein we can bring it on the table that this is what we can value add and look for partners. So like that, if I, I did a little bit of search on the topics where India is dominant and it is an interesting mix from all subject areas. So I do see work on biodiesel and we already know that like a lot of work is going on in biodiesel in India itself and India is leading there. Then semiconductor plasmas. So this is technology we are talking about. Then prenatal care in the medicine section or the healthcare. Then Ayurvedic medicine and our government is also doing a lot in this area and probably that's one of the reasons uh, that we do see a lot of research coming up in this area. Plus estuaries. That's it. That's interesting. Uh, uh, are they talking about uh, how you uh, talk about the ecosystem over there or uh, the employment opportunities over there, the work life, the social uh, life over there, etc. So first we need to uh, zero in on the strength area of research from our university. So this I'm showing at the India level. I did not go into a a specific university, this I'm showing at the India level, but you should be doing at your university level and accordingly showcase it to the world and thereby invite the relevant collaborations and also look for the relevant collaborations. So next step, what I did, I just took one of the examples, the first topmost where India is strong in is biodiesel. Now, what all research, so we can find out what all research is happening globally in the area of biodiesel. So let's now not restrict ourselves to India. We now know this is our strength. We figure out what the world is working on. So the world is interested in the internal combustion engine, how it will change if biodiesel is being used. Uh, what's the exhaust gas recirculation, jet tropa, how is it used, uh, direct injection, etc. So we get to know the specific topics the rest of the world is working on, what is their need. So we look at our strength, then we map the need of the world. What, are, what do they require? And then we figure out who requires or who is doing this sort of research because that is the need of that nation. So if I look at the biodiesel uh, analysis, then China is leading, followed by India, the United States, Malaysia, and United Kingdom. So what we could have done is, from here, from let's say this keyword mapping, I could have figured out that this is my strength, let's say Jatropa is my strength, and I know that uh, Malaysia is working on turbochargers over here, so I can present a case study and go forward with a collaboration. Now, when we are talking about collaboration, it is not only we should be restricted about academic collaborations, but if we really want to get uh, an impact in the real world, we can also look at academia industry collaboration as well, because uh, the closer partnerships will drive innovation and new technology in this field and also help us prepare with a skilled workforce, which is ready for the industry tomorrow. Now, this point is very, very important because most of the times what we hear from the recruiting agencies and the industry uh, captains that, you know, the student is not fit, uh, is not ready for industry. They are not skilled correctly. So for that, we need to understand what is the requirement of the industry as well. What are they working on? Can we have those courses in our university as well and boost collaborations. So if you look at now the India 
acad uh, industry collaboration. On, I'm looking at complete India. So India academia collaboration is at 1.2 percent of its total publications. Uh, and if you will see their quality of work that comes out of such collaboration is really, really good. So wherein we talk about non corporate collaboration or non-industry collaboration, it is FWCI is 0.97, so almost at world average of one. So it is, but it is almost at 1.9 or almost two for academic corporate collaboration. Now we can figure out who are the top players in the corporate in India who are into research. Not everybody is doing research. Only a handful of them would be doing it. Who are they? Who are those players? So I can see again over here, a mix of industries. I can see Tata Group, which is there in uh, various sectors. I can see Fortis, which is there in healthcare. I can see ONGC, right, which is there in petrochemical. Uh, I can see Bharat Electronics, which is uh, again, technology, material science, et cetera. Uh, we have Hindustan Aeronautics, Mahindra and Mahindra into automobiles, et cetera. So we have a mix of industry uh, in India itself, who are working on various topics and who we can actually approach for project development. Now, going back to our example of biodiesels, wherein I showed that we have our strength, India has our strength in this topic. Then why limit ourselves to Indian Indian academic, uh, Indian corporate collaborations? Why not look outside? So who are the people working across the globe in this area? So we do see, uh, US companies, German companies uh, listed over here. And we are proud to see Tata Group uh, being one of the top uh, collaborators uh, with academia in this uh, list. We can also find out who are the top authors over here. So rather than doing a very generic way of approaching collaboration, find out from here who is publishing what and who are the authors involved so that you can reach out to the right person. Because otherwise, if you look at, let's say, Tata Group itself, it's a very big group. Who do you approach to becomes a question. So need to find out who's working on what and accordingly figure out the right person to approach to. Not only this, if I'm not today, let's say I'm not working on biodiesel, right? But I'm working on affiliated fields or find out what other affiliated fields these collaborators are working on. So besides biodiesel, these collaborators are also working on aerosols, turbochargers, thermal management, particulate emissions. So is this something else that I can map to my researchers and come up with a very consolidated project that not only biodiesel, but also we talk about fuel consumption and uh, engine development also with you. So I am talking about a bigger solution and a bigger project. So this way you can uh, map uh, your strength to the right uh, collaborator. Also, if I now come back to NEP, NEP talks about that India must take a lead in preparing our professionals in some cutting edge technologies. Uh, if you talk about, you know, uh, the document itself talks about artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, nanotechnology, uh, big data, etc. So it will be great since there is a lot of focus of the government also, the push also from the government is there. And accordingly, a lot of funding opportunities will be mapped over here. So it will be good if your university starts working on these areas or at least start mapping. Uh, who all are working in our university on these areas and how we can you know uh, implement it at our level so let's say so in the first part of the presentation i did tell you that first you map in your strength what is our strength and uh, what i can bring on the table the second way around what you could do is look at areas where you want to develop in where you want to grow and then map who are the leaders in that segment. So this is the second approach. So because NEP, let's say, talked about a lot about artificial intelligence. So now I figure out who are the leaders in uh, artificial intelligence and how can I get my university researchers up to that uh, level, 
uh, across, uh, you know, and benchmark so that they're able to benchmark globally. So if I look at artificial intelligence, uh, the research is led by China, followed by US, and then India, etc. What are the topics that people are working on in this area? So we do see convolution neural network is leading. So are we working in that area? If not, we can start building it up. And uh, also what we could do is uh, look for, uh, as I said, experts in this area to either recruit, recruit them to our university uh, or mentor our researchers. So we could look for corporates again. So which are the corporates working? Alphabet, uh, Microsoft, etc. We could look at India level also. We could look at academia also. So over here, academia wise, if I'm seeing in India, then uh, Anna University, VIT, SRM, MIT, etc. They are leading. Now it's very interesting to note that all the five universities that we have in artificial intelligence are private universities. Now, is this a very focused approach that they are taking? And that's why they are here or just because they are more uh, technology intensive and that's why they are leading in artificial intelligence. So we have to we have to do some more diligence on this point because there is a possibility because the private sector would want to attract more talent, uh, more money, which otherwise is very difficult for them. Uh, that they are keeping a very focus that, OK, NEP talks about artificial intelligence, let's just get into it. So. Uh, it's a very strategic approach, which I think uh, the rest of the university should also be taking ahead to uh, in have attract the right talent also, because the student of next generation will be interested in these new technologies. Now, the question always is like that uh, artificial intelligence. I am a university, I'm a small university in a tier two city and uh, we cater to all subject areas and it is not only technology that we are working technology is just part of it i understand that but you have to understand that artificial technologies like artificial intelligence will cut across sector like over here uh, artificial intelligence people will of course be researching in the area of computer science but they can also be working in the area of mathematics medicine social sciences decision science etc and this we're talking about the global structure. So if we, and it's very interesting if we are able to find the right mentor also, because sometimes you are like, oh, you know, all the top authors over here will be from outside the country and it is out of our bandwidth to help our student or researcher, you know, collaborate or connect with them. Uh, maybe yes, but not, not always. Because let's say I took this example of energy because we were talking about biodiesel. Uh, so I thought that energy would make a, the right fit or right example for this. So if I look at the energy sector and I look at the top professors in this sector, then I see Professor Bhim Singh. He is a renowned professor from IIT Delhi. He's leading the world in this research. So a top expert is already available with us why not use his mentorship to improve on our uh, research, let's say on the area of uh, clean energy and artificial intelligence. So the thought is to find, to be able to map our strengths, to be able to zero in on areas where we want to grow, strategic areas which are important not only for the university but also for the country then look outside who else is working on that who are the top leaders and not only from a quantity perspective but from a quality perspective wherein we can enhance our skills and even make it uh, more visible to the rest of the world and this is how we can help India uh, be the Vishwaguru, which is, uh, I would say, the dream of our uh, country. And this can be achieved by improving internationalization so that there is uh, more credibility on our research. We can use it by leveraging our existing partnerships, who all we are working with right now. We showcase our strength 
to build new alliances with new countries, uh, with new researchers. But also important and most important of it all is to measure and track the success of these collaborations. Because see, if we are just doing collaborations for just for the sake of it, just to get a number, then we lose on the very purpose. So we need to keep track and keep measuring who all are we working? Are we reaping in the right benefits? If it is not, then we choose other partners uh, and build a stronger story for our university's research. So with this, I will end my presentation. And I'll be happy to take up any questions if we have time now. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Shubhra. We'll take the questions later. Uh, we'll go for the next presentation. But thank you so much for outlining you know, the pathway that Indian institutions can take to achieve research excellence. I mean, uh, I don't have enough words of appreciation for the excellent uh, the presentation that you've done. So thank you once again. Uh, again, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce the next speaker, Dr. Borun Mojumdar who's a data analyst at the Koch Institute of Integrative Cancer Research, MIT. He has a PhD in theoretical physics from ISER Kolkata and experience in working with various kinds of data and computational models. Uh, Barun uh, is a recipient of the Fulbright Nehru postdoctoral uh, research, uh, postdoctoral uh, fellowship at Montana State University. But in addition to that, he also has postdoc experience uh, at Wilfrid Laurier University, Ontario, Canada, and University of Tennessee, Knoxville. So without uh, further ado, I uh, would now request uh, uh, Dr. Majumdar to, uh, uh, for his presentation. Uh, Dr. Majumdar, over to you. Uh, can you hear me? Can you yes. hear me? Yes, okay. yes, yes. So, okay. Thank you, Dr. Duck. Um, thank you, Dr. Mittal, Dr. Pani, and um, others for um, giving me an opportunity to talk on, on this particular uh, topic. So my topic for today is identifying an ideal research collaborator. I would be talking uh, from an individual perspective and not from a collaborational perspective, um, taking uh, the matter of finding an ideal research collaborator um, to the micro level. Now, um, I would expect that mainly the audience here are from the universities or colleges um, and maybe less from the IITs or um, the MHRD institutes like IISC and ISERS. Um, so to start with, um, you probably have a question in mind, those who are listening from different universities or colleges from all over India, that um, why is this talk kind of important? You maybe have a question in mind like that, or why I am listening to this person, what is new that he could say? So basically, I must honestly say that there is nothing absolutely new what I am presenting in my slides, but my experiences are kind of different. And that might um, help us to start a discussion from an individual level. Um, so the views that I will be presenting here, these are my own and definitely in any form or any, any way, do not reflect any entity or any other organization. Um, so the talk is all about identifying an ideal research collaborator. So I would say it's better to put mentor. Um, why mentor? Because mentors are kind of always very important in our life to move forward. And at this point of time, um, I personally think I am a student and not eminent into anything. Um, I still do work on my own hands, do the analysis. So I myself consider um, as a student um, and that's how we would say that the mentors, the greatest mentors that I have received in my life um, came in the form of uh, Professor Narayan Banerjee, who was my PhD um, advisor. Uh, Dr. Shoura Dash, who is a professor in the University of Lethbridge, whom I met, uh, met in, a, in a conference at um, IMSC in Chennai. 
And from there, uh, my independent research career started. It He helped me actually publish seven single author papers during my PhD, um, but he never took any authorship. He just guided me. So if I if I if I am talking about identifying an ideal research collaborator, um, like did I knew or heard any of these kind of talks before I started? Probably not. It just started just like that, uh, because um, myself and I know a few other people had a zeal for doing research, and that's how we we just started. I have one example of one of my friend. Um, I can name him because I will be saying good things about him. Probably Rudra, he is in, in, a, in a college in West Bengal um, under Calcutta University, and he does international collaborations right now with, with every, like, um, people from every part of the world. I have published a few paper with him in the last two, three years, and he is doing absolutely great. So if you call this as an uh, addition to the international collaboration from a small uh, college from uh, Calcutta, uh, of course, it is because he's publishing papers with different other collaborators. Uh, one example I would request you to look at uh, is Mohit Joli, and he works in one of the um, cutting edge fields of research, and he is one of the most promising uh, young researcher from uh, from India and one of the finest. So he probably um, got trained in one of the best institutes in, in Texas and somebody from his group, some professor from his group might even get a Nobel Prize. So he took all these ideas and mentorship and whatever he gained as an experience in um, research, he took it to India and is now working at IISC and is very, very productive with a very high quality research um, output. So uh, that's why I would like to talk, say uh, about this, that identifying an ideal research mentor and not a collaborator to start with. Now, the thing is why international collaborations are in general important for us. So basically, the main question that I can ask you that if I am, if I am living as a frog inside a well, which is 100 meter deep inside the ground, and I try to find how the universe works um, or what are the stars made up of, um, how can I do that? And that is an interesting question to ask. And I was given this question 10 years ago by one of my supervisors. And the question, uh, the answer to this question could be, if I know some amount of mathematics or physics, then I can try to make a model. Now, how do I know that my model is right? Because it has to be tested. If I talk to another frog, then he might give me another, he or she might give me another model to work with. Now it depends on the statistics or the data, how I can test these models and then find out uh, in the pursuit of knowledge, which one is right. So basically that's why we need to talk uh, about research more to others, first of all, uh, in the close vicinity of ourselves. And then if we can get uh, international collaborations to work with other people, um, mainly I would talk about from the US because I'm, I'm a big fan of the research. Um, so the first point would be to know more about the state of art research. And why US? Because so it's Dr. very... Uh, so in last year, with uh, last two years with Dr. Hausai and senior colleagues, I don't want to mention any names, but uh, I have been having chance Mr. to be precise. Mr. Vijay Kumar, Mr. Uh, Vijay Kumar, may I request you to kindly keep your phone on switch of mode? Thank you. Uh, Barun, yeah, okay. Barun, please continue. Yeah, so the first thing would be to know more about the state of art research that is happening um, in the US or Germany, as I will show you some maps because these are uh, these countries are in the forefront of research in many different uh, fields. So uh, I cannot move alone. Um, I have to take help from others who can guide me. So it's better to find collaborators in that sense or to find mentors in that sense and it's better if we can get some international collaboration. Now, the, the person who actually um, was doing research and I talked about him, Pravi Rudra, he, I, I learned from him that he started with some visits um, to Ayuka from the institute uh, where he's working in Kolkata and the mentors from there helped him find um, research collaborations all over the world, uh, some in US, uh, some in different parts of Europe. And it's a very um, hard truth that there cannot be any mediocrity in research. If you are doing high quality of research, then that is research. If that is not the case, then I don't know what to say, 
but that is of no use. That is basically <clears throat> putting a research paper into the bin, but nobody might use it. So it's always better to learn from the best in the field. Otherwise, we'd be lagging behind, or we may be blinded by the idea that we don't know what we're doing. Um, our country, or like any any one country, cannot move alone uh, for bigger research uh, projects in the pursuit of knowledge um, in general. So large research or large scale research projects like Sun, uh, Large Hadron Collider, like OLISA, they always required huge amount of fundings. And, and then um, the most uh, important story that I must tell you that LIGO India is still working. They got the project um, after competing with Australia and the detectors that will detect gravitational waves from different astrophysical scenarios will be observed somewhere down in the South India. So it's a large collaboration, international collaboration with funding from different countries from US and Europe. And, and it's a good project uh, to be um, a part of. Um, then we have access to diverse perspectives, specialized knowledge, expertise that come together if we try to collaborate from different parts of the world or from different parts of India that may not be available to me uh, individually. Then of course, the most important part that I learned um, from Fulbright um, is the cultural exchange. It's very, very important to know about different cultures, develop an understanding of how things work there because the system is completely different. Then I can get those knowledges, uh, get those knowledge and help our own researchers to build meaningful policies that can help um, our own people. Um, so basically, um, there are two okay there are two other points in this uh, in this slides so there are definitely as we have just overcome the pandemic era of the covid so there are global challenges in health um, in poverty and then then requires international collaboration or global collaboration to address or deal with these issues if we don't come together then it would be problem uh, for all of us as a as a global citizen for example i remember from the news that india took a huge step forward um, to to help many different uh, backward countries uh, and supply them with the vaccine when the us itself did not have that much to offer so that was only because of the medical research and the biopharma research that we have in india and it's not easy to just make a vaccine within at least, as I remember, one and a half month of time when the COVID started in the December of 1919. Uh, science communication, of course, this is one of the most important things what scientists or researchers or professors have to offer uh, to the government officials when, when they start making decisions uh, about how they can spend taxpayers' money and make meaningful policies for public in general. So these are the research motivations for individuals, which you can definitely find anywhere if you Google it. It's for the advancement of knowledge, solving problems, uh, career advancement. It is a very personal, but a very important one because we are all human beings and we basically need a position and uh, money to live. Personal interest, this works for many people because they are actually passionate about a particular field and economic development, if you do research, uh, because economic development in the US, that's as far as I remember in the 100 years, is only driven by research, which started back in 1880s or something. And it started many different kinds of technological revolutions, and that was only possible uh, by doing good quality research. Now, the thing is, these are the research motivations for individuals. Now, my question is, why would you co collaborate on an international level? Now, the, the, the matter of fact is the research scenarios are different in each and every country. Um, let us start with some kind of a negativity because it's always good to start some negativity which can start a discussion um, and then we can put uh, forward some ideas. Now, let's say if I have a job and that job is permanent, why would I want to collaborate? Um, that is one of the most important things. I will show you some numbers which exactly may not align with um, with what 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 Shubra said, but but I will I will tell you um, that how I can get around it. Now, for example, I have seen in many different cases, but I will not name them. My my uh, friends, well, we are doing PhDs, and some senior friends 
when they got uh, positions in, in, in one of the most reputed institutes in India, after five years, they do not publish anything. They do not have uh, high quality publications. So that is not expected from them when, when, when you are in an international level and when people want uh, you to produce and produce good quality papers, not just by poking our names with others' work and claim that is our own publication. So these are these are the truth that we wish everyone should discuss because these are some of the important challenges that we had to face. Now, even one of my, um, uh, even the policies that initially I learned from Dr. Mittal that you want to take um, uh, in India on a global level, um, and uh, different kinds of international policies that you may be planning to work on, we learned about those policies. And as I remember from one of the mentors who is Professor Suzy Jain, and also uh, Professor Raghunath Anand Mashalkar, he was the former Director General of uh, CSIR, and Sudhir Jain was the uh, director at IIT Gandhinagar who basically recruited me. He is a very visionary person and eminent researcher and an excellent person and a, and a mentor. Um, and he always pinpointed those issues and he was always with us how, how we can get more funding to, to support our research and publish more good quality papers. That was his only focus. And he could go to any limit to, to, to help us well, even from uh, with some seed funding on an institute level. So uh, these are the questions that we need to first address because the scenario for international collaborations are kind of a little bit different. Now, let me tell you why. Now, research for individuals in the USA. So these are, these are my own observations. So they are basically dominated by the same kind of people that we have in India. Uh, they are basically dominated by a very high percentage of Indians and they are doing great. They start as students, they become professionals and later join uh, research companies or, or become professors in the US. And you know uh, many of them and they are doing exceptionally great when it uh, comes to producing quality research. Um, academic positions there are nine to 10 month paid. So percentage of the total time uh, is divided into teaching and research and are mentioned in their contracts. In some cases, uh, most of them, uh, many of them, um, I would not say most of them, many of them get 80% funding from research. And uh, no research funding means no pay for two, three months. Now, these are the investigators or professors, those who are there, and this is how their contract is. So the main idea there is publish or perish. Now, academic promotions depend highly on the research output. Now, do I do work? Yes, I do work, otherwise I will not get uh, funding, I would not get paid, I would not get promotions. So for that reason, I have to work. And this is one of the most <clears throat> basic questions <clears throat> to ask for if there is a backing for my work or not. Research as an entrepreneurship, that is how it is treated in the US. So you will live with your, it's basically your own company. You will live with students, maybe a regulated company, and then you have your own postdocs who train the students and faculty is always run to get more and more funding to support their research or their small company, which is, which is kind of regulated. Even the monthly salary is being negotiated depending on how much funds they have. So if I have a job which is permanent and then I, I know when I will retire and I do not have that much of a push uh, to do research, then why would, would, where do I fit in the scenario? And for international collaborations, what am I bringing to the table? Because research is not easy in the US as you, as you can see from my last slide, they have to do for an earning or they have to do it for a living or they have to do it to keep their uh, position alive and they have to do quality research. Uh, this is not the scenario in most uh, places in India where the job is stable. So one has to bring up the research productivity in a very higher level. So this is how a network uh, looks like. This uh, similar things in some of the slides um, Shubhra has also shown. So this is a basically a graphical um, network analysis with some data uh, from some publications. Uh, this is from a publication that I took. The link is given below. And uh, the nodes are the countries, but you can do a weighted, um, weighted um, what should I say, age, age map. Uh, because the edges can be thicker or thinner. Uh, thicker edges means more and more collaboration. 
Now you can see that India usually have much more collaborations with USA, Germany, nowadays China, and also UK. So these are the main collaborating countries for India. This is also a similar map, which will give you the same idea. Um, if this data is basically taken from nature.com and I just navigated their pages, whatever they have. So uh, I, I just took it and um, this is how I reference it. So this is what the international collaboration look like. The thicker uh, lines are, are, are much more collaborative efforts done between countries. Now you can see that the, the lines are more thicker between China and the USA, which are red and green in color. And this is somewhere where we, we, are, we lie in their map, uh, which is India. Uh, we do have collaborations, but not as much as compared to some other competing countries. So we have a long way to go. This is not the end of it. Now, if we see only Indian collaborations, we can see the Indian map here. Um, and then we have very good collaborations with the US in general. And then, uh, as I said, now it is China, United Kingdom, Germany, and France. Now, I exactly don't know whether the students, those who are from India, go there and publish papers with their, they, whether they are counting as to be an Indian publication or not. Now, if I look at the data, if I zoom into the data, and, and if you can see that the count, this is for a particular year that the date range is mentioned. If you see the count, the count is 1858. And I have not mentioned it here, the count for our neighboring country, China, is more than 20,000. Um, sorry, it's, it's more than 28,000. So basically, we, we, we do have a long way to go. And the subjects, um, I mean, it's obvious that the outputs uh, would be dominated by subjects like chemistry, physical sciences, art sciences, and life sciences. And the participation of those subjects you can see um, in this, um, in this um, map. And if I go to these slides, who are the main collaborators uh, with percentage of share uh, in international collaborations? We can see that uh, in the first four places, USA, Germany, UK, and China are there. And then there are other countries also uh, collaborating with India. Tomorrow. Now we have the top 10 countries, the same map uh, who India is collaborating and how much share they have as a research percentage. This is just uh, to show you. Um, and that percentage uh, looks very nice. It's almost roughly equal um, in share. Um, uh, so that means India is actually offering a huge amount of funding in international research collaborations these days. Now, which are the top 10 institutes, basically? So if I, if I count these shares, I basically get the shares to be more than half than what I have shown as the total share. Now, these are mainly from the Indian Institutes of Science. Um, as you can see, the data is from nature.com. So definitely they have neglected some of the um, journals which have publications which are uh, of low impact, definitely. So it's obvious that we have Indian Institute of Science um, nothing to mention about them, one of, like one of the finest institutes in the world. And then we have the IITs, um, Isar Bhopal, uh, Isars basically, JNCSR, everyone know. Um, uh, it's a very, um, very good institute for doing chemistry research to start with. And then we have CSIRs. So where, where are we? Like as the universities, where are the uni Indian universities? Because this takes half of the share. So that means you have to uh, go a long way to contribute and then ramp up this number from 1858 to somewhere around 30,000. So, so that means on an individual level, the research uh, output needs to be increased uh, much, much more. Now, the thing is uh, like uh, also these days in many, uh, this is one of the articles that I read uh, in the Nature Index. It was published in 1st July the top 10 countries for scientific research in 2018 um, i'm i'm sorry that we it's blank because we don't have india in this um, in this in this list um, so we, we there is a long way to go as i'm saying repeatedly because it is so um, okay so identifying a research uh, collaborator now i have few important uh, things to say uh, basically, those who are those who are teaching in the colleges or those who are doing um, teaching in the universities, even if you have PhD, now we are talking about forming a uh, successful international collaboration. 
for like this is my own opinion, but I would suggest to try to do a postdoc, even if not for long, take some leave, do a postdoc, get to know uh, the research environment in one of the best institutes in the world. Um, it's always better to get trained, relatively easier to form collaborations. And if not even collaborations, they will definitely help you in getting mentorship. Continue doing research, try to publish good quality of papers. If you don't, then there is no point in starting the conversation. And it's also true that financial freedom through, through funding will give you more independence to make a project of your own in which you can invite international researchers. So you can use your own CV or your own publications as a, as a marker to test your capability um, as a researcher. Determine the skills uh, and expertise. There are many fields in, in theoretical research these days. We need to update our skills. For example, in the biomedical research, there is something called single cell analysis, uh, single cell sequencing analysis, nuclear uh, sequencing analysis. So these sequencing analyses are very important uh, to determine anything uh, through machine learning and AI. And we need to have all those expertise um, because these are computational and we have very good computational resources in India. So we, we need to learn all the skills um, for all this, even for all these smaller uh, universities and colleges. It's better to start with that. Follow the new publications that I think is important in your area of interest. If you think authors are cited, not cited your work, you can email them, uh, make a context, and then that could be a starting point to discuss how you can uh, you, how you can like um, start doing future collaborations and make uh, making some good questions. Track the citations. It is very important these days because citations are a very good number uh, to measure how good of a researcher you are. So you have to track your own citations and your own publication and find out why your work is cited. Maybe sometimes it's cited in the introduction, that's not very important. But if it is not cited in the introduction, then, then definitely the authors of the other paper have considered it seriously. So that can be a conversation starter, um, which could lead to a good, good collaboration. Uh, so definitely send your manuscript to inter some of the international researchers that you know, who are capable of giving, who you think are capable of giving you critical feedback. This is, this is very important. Network, networking is this is one of the most important things that many researchers use as, as tools and networking through social media is also as an important tool. So attend conferences that, that, that conference I talked about that helped me gain enough experience and basically start a collaboration which lasted for more than, more than at least seven years. So join different organizations, uh, scientific ones, associations, societies, and take part in online forums to connect with different researchers. Make your own web page. That is a very good idea to promote your own research and, and connect to the international researchers through Twitter. In most of the cases, they, they remain active in the Twitter. That's a, that's a tech savvy thing these days through social media, promoting your own research, and sometimes you can connect to them very easily. Um, be, be ambitious, that's, that's, that there is no other way around. Like if we have to do good research, each one of us, including myself, we have to be ambitious. We have to respect others' time, those who are seriously doing their own research and we have to work hard. There is no other way around uh, to, to form successful collaborations. Um, I, I literally remember one of the uh, bigger, big projects um, started uh, by TIFR 10, 10 to 15 years ago. Um, in one of the southern parts of India regarding neutrinos to, to capture neutrinos, but somehow that didn't uh, work out well and that was not a successful project. So to make a successful collaboration, the only thing we have to do is become ambitious and then, and then work hard, that's it. Um, then what, where, where do the invitation part go? So if I have a concrete proposal, that's what I did, before even contacting a professor for, for Fulbright, I actually wrote my own uh, concrete proposal and that had some, some narrow, uh, narrowly boiled down questions specific to a particular problem in the research and not an open-ended open one because open-ended discussions basically never go, go anywhere. So whatever concrete proposal has to be written that has to be supported by uh, the publications, uh, citations, um, and, and a specific goal, timelines, expectations, everything about the project. And then you can mail uh, one of the researchers that you like to contact. 
you have to demonstrate your credibility that you, you are skilled to do that research, prove your track record of publications and start quantitative conversations and not a qualitative one uh, to, to show people that you can actually uh, eligible for, the, for a successful collaborations. Uh, because it's important that I told you that many of the researchers in the US or the Europe, they basically do not have time because they are running after funding uh, to keep the, keep the lab uh, alive. So you have to make a way or you have to get away into their time so that they may think that you are a very good addition in the group to start working with. Um, complementary expertise, you have to look for uh, some co expertise complementary to your own because that becomes, uh, that makes the collaboration more different um, and bring fresh perspectives or new ideas into research and you are complementing um, the, the uh, collaborator uh, for their own ideas. Uh, reputation, yeah, it's always better to also ga gauge the track record of publications for the researchers you are trying to contact or email them, evaluate their experience, look at their publication record. It's very important that you also do some kind of evaluation from your side. Uh, availability of funding and also like availability of their time, like make sure they have enough time to devote, they can discuss the project with you. Uh, because my supervisor always uh, gave me time from Montana. He is now in the University of Illinois, um, so he changed positions. But but he was very active in re responding to my emails and questions that we used to have. Uh, it's easy to check whether the person who are trying to collaborate with well-funded or not. Check NIH or NSF sites that what I know for the U.S. And you can find their funding or the funding information, project information, everything in those sites. These are publicly available. And also it's it's very important these days that collaboration is a shared responsibility. What you find as data, you have to keep the data intact, respect the policies of the funding agencies of uh, country specific policies uh, and, not, uh, and not alter the data in any way or in any form. And plagiarism is, as you know, is definitely not accepted in the research um, ethics and integrity. Um, maybe it's a good idea to try jointly write proposals after you find your um, your uh, person who are who is responding to you write joint scholarships like Fulbright, Humboldt, Marie Curie. There are many different scholarships, and this will this will foster growth in the publication, uh, show some seriousness in the project, and and funding always helps. Um, it helps for travel purposes. It helps for joining conferences, and present your uh, research. It's always helpful. Now, important things to consider. Uh, this is very important if you're students or postdocs, they are very helpful in building connections. I know many of them, um, unlike my supervisor, they do not um, give enough freedom to discuss the projects or the ideas with other supervisors. They're too restrictive of that. It was not the case for my supervisors, which helped me and gave me the freedom to work in scientific problems because it's all about science and progress. So use your pro students and supervisors. They are very capable, very, very proactive and very productive at their age. So they may help you find research opportunities and collaborations by going to conferences, by going presenting their papers in posters. And even uh, from some international visits, they have their own um, travel funds they can apply to. Please do help uh, help them find those things. Connect to researchers, mainly Indian origin ones, those who stay in the US, they are really very good um, in publications and they are well reputed. So they sometimes come in conferences and that could be a starting point uh, to form, form a collaborations. Try to connect to professors. This is what I personally believe uh, initially uh, for individuals to second and third tier universities. It's always better not to go for MIT, Harvard, Stanford, or anything from the East Coast or the West Coast because they are very busy and they may not give you time uh, to respond or there could be problems. I have heard from many researchers, those who have traveled uh, that far to bigger universities, they have complained that the, their supervisors do not give them time, many different problems. Uh, sometimes technical issues, maybe, I don't know whose fault it is, but it's always better to go for second and third tier universities. They, in general, would be more happy to help you and guide you um, with their time. Uh, so the most important thing that I recently observed post-COVID times, 
uh, what happened during the COVID, the, the companies have basically profited in huge amounts and they have almost recruited many students and postdocs in their jobs. So basically as because the university professors um, the, the, okay, they, they work in non-profit organizations, so the pay is relatively less. So there is a huge uh, influx of students in graduate programs and also postdocs in the US in the last two, three years, a very high number, like the number increased to almost 10 times than last five years. And this is because those who are already there, they were absorbed in some private companies or in some research companies and some profitable organizations to do the work. Uh, but but the the postdoc positions that's why increased in large numbers. So you may use this as an opportunity to start um, the international collaboration that you may like, and also for guidance and mentorship you can join STEM peers. This is a Facebook group found by an IISC alumni for researchers. They are all more or less scientists, and they have done uh, really really um, good in their own pursuit of uh, research. So you can directly connect to them, even ask them any questions, they would be happy to guide you. Now, this is the map as I was talking about, uh, because they are, uh, recently I've heard about too many complaints about some of the universities that the professors don't give time, their postdocs don't give time. Some are kind of also bullied, I would not say that. So if you want to make fruitful collaborations, it's better to target the universities in those states, uh, which is in right in the middle of the US. They would definitely help you um, even, um, even writing or drafting the paper that you may write together. So they, have, uh, they, ha they can give you the most amount of time which is needed. And it's just a start that you need. Um, how much will you continue with them? start working with, after starting working with them maybe 10 years 15 years who knows but that will definitely uh, give you growth it's just the mentorship to start with um, with this um, i i actually i'm uh, finishing my talk if you have any questions let me know if you want to connect to some of the us researchers please let me know i helped many of my students all of them are now um, in in the us right now and those students i found them in iit gandhinagar um, so it's it's always a good to start to talk to, uh, and uh, no, of course this is like we can talk about research anytime. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mittal, uh, Dr. Dia, and Dr. Pani for giving me this opportunity to talk. Uh, this is what I have. Um, and any questions? So thank you so much, Barun, and uh, thanks uh, to Subra also. Of course, both the presentations were very, very informative and insightful. We have received a bunch of messages in the message chat box. Many of the participants are writing that the session was really informative. So many thanks for that. And thanks to Dr. Dia for uh, presenting our speakers and uh, uh, facilitating such a marvelous presentation, which was indeed informative. And with this, we can open the floor. We can take a few questions. I think the presentations were amply self-explanatory, but still if anybody has uh, uh, to seek any clarification, you are welcome. We can take only a few questions. As you know, we have already overshot our time for 30, 35 minutes. We were not expecting the show to be such interesting that we will be amused. So please uh, limit your questions to numbers only and very brief, no comments, only questions for clarification. Thank you. <laughs> no questions. I think the points Hello. were. Hello, sir. Yes, Hello. Guru. Guru Ghasidas. Yeah, I am uh, Dr. Rajesh Sharma from Guru Ghasidas uh, Central University. Uh, so, about the talks, uh, we are really thankful to all of our speakers, uh, those who have given us a lot of knowledge and how to establish uh, different type of collaborations. I have a quick question for uh, Madam Datta. So uh, about the private institution, she has uh, emphasized that uh, most of our publications from India, they, these are coming from the private institutions. So in my opinion, uh, our private institutions in India, they are just contributing to the uh, 
quantity of the publications, not to the quality of the publications. So can you comment on that, please? Thank you so much, sir. A very, very relevant question. And I, uh, I'm happy that you were observant throughout the session. So uh, first of all, let me just clarify. When I talked about that private coming out with a lot of uh, publications, I did not mean uh, overall at India level. It was only when we were looking at artificial intelligence, only that portion, not the rest of it. So please uh, do not have it in mind that uh, overall, uh, uh, private institutions are going ahead. If you see, if you would remember the first slide where I showed the top contributors in terms of collaboration from India, it was mainly the IITs which were there. So that was for overall India. Uh, second, you have a very valid point about quantity versus quality that is there. And when we, I did a small uh, recap of that. I did not show that data because it was not relevant for today, a comparison of uh, uh, public versus private, uh, definitely the quality wise government, the public universities are still leading ahead, but we do see uh, because of NEP and various programs run by the government, the private is also now uh, working, striving towards improving on its quality because otherwise it's difficult to get in students, uh, difficult to get funding, difficult to form collaborations, etc. So I think quality is something that everybody all of us in the higher education sector should be looking at. Thank you. Can I put a one question? May I be allowed? Yeah, Dr. Das, please go on. Can you switch yeah, I may beg to defer uh, the thumb, madam. No, no, and, can you uh, make your video switch on, please? Oh, sorry, okay, yeah. See, I beg to defer on two aspects. The number one is that how much grant a government university get and compare the grant in terms of the output of the university. This is one. Another aspect is the private university. See, there have always been a, you know, a kind of debate and uh, uh, maybe a controversy that the private universities, they uh, do do a lot of uh, mess up in uh, terms of negotiating with the qualities and all these things. But look at the investment that you have made on the uh, public universities and what they have been doing. Are they serious about their own contributions? Then why this uh, mushrooming condition of the private institutions have come up in India? It is because of the uh, you know, low quality and uh, negligence and then non-serious non part of the public universities. That's how the government, the private universities have come up. So what is my point of uh, you know, uh, submission here is, we should not compare all the private universities into one uh, platform. You can consider the Chandigarh University so far, you take, that, take the data from Chandigarh University of Punjab, take the lovely professional university, they are far more and they are at, at par with the government universities. And very soon we will be also leading uh, one of the best universities in, in India and in, maybe in the continent also. Look at the structure, That's look at our uh, you know, curriculum uh, part and then our, our contribution. Dr. So Dr. it's not all the time. Dr. Das, it is not a competition between private and government. There yeah, are yeah, good private yeah. universities, there are good government universities, there are bad private universities, there are bad government universities. So it's not a competition. <laughs> we want everybody to be doing good. That's why we are holding these webinars so that the ones who are not doing very well, they can be doing well. So it's and not a I, fight between private and government. Both are good and both are equally required in the system. Absolutely. Thank I you. think Thank Dr. Mitchell has comments. put it well. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm also from uh, Guru Ghasi Das University. Yeah. Uh, Dr. So uh, just a little inquiry from uh, Dr. Uh, Subhadita. Uh, you showed scholarly output. So uh, what it includes? Uh, it includes research uh, articles and uh, patents and uh, yeah, just clarify that. Yes, sir. So when we meant uh, scholarly output, so we are looking at uh, journal publications, uh, then books, uh, conference proceedings, uh, uh, reviews. That's about it. Patents are not counted in this. Oh, okay, thank you.
shall we conclude ma'am hello uh, can i ask a uh, simple question to uh, ms datta please introduce yourself okay fine so myself dr rahul pandey and i am from chikara university punjab and um, i'm having a very basic question to ms datta like she presented all the data using cywell which is a very powerful tool okay but how can someone who don't have access to cywell can analyze those metrics to initiate the collaboration so cywell is one of the powerful tools that i have showed you but the idea was to uh, share with you that what all parameters that you should be looking into uh, while assessing your uh, strengths uh because it's easier said but unless you have a visual of it it's very difficult to understand that's why i showed it to you otherwise if you have internal mechanisms to you know uh, overview and analyze what all research areas you're growing in because you would be doing some internal analysis also your iqac department would be doing it or your research office would be doing it so you would be having that data also so work on that the idea was just to showcase the parameters that you can use to build on your collaborations it can come from anywhere okay thank you so much but the major major question is like yes we can do uh, internal data analysis but what about the others like if i want to access the data of uh, let's say mit university or iit or somebody else then i don't i do not have access to penetrate their database so in that of case but what one uh, can do in that case i would say there are lot of platforms which are available for you to use of course they will not be free because you are looking at somebody else's uh, data as well so somebody else is doing that work for you so i think there would be a lot of paid platforms which you can utilize definitely thank you so much so any more questions or uh, i would like to conclude and before conclusion madam would you like to say a few words i was say thanks to dr shubhra datta excellent presentation and we we ourselves came to know about many many data can you tell me i mean from both of you i would like to know whether we can share your presentation on aiu website if you say yes we will request you to send a copy so that we can share it on the aiu website otherwise i have taken some screenshots <laughs> no worries ma'am screens uh, I would be happy to share it with you. So I will uh, share it with Dr. Dia, and she'll coordinate with you. Okay. So Dr. Barun, can we share your presentation? Because many of the uh, our university people would be wanting to have your presentations for future references. Can we share it with them? Yes, yes. I will send you you um or Dia a copy. Um, but regarding this whole presentation, I have something to say to you. Um. um the plans that you are basically uh, trying to make and the policies you may uh, this is my own personal opinion you may uh, once talk to professor sudhir jain uh, because he has actually implemented kind of all the policies uh, when for, during his 15 year tenure in iit gandhinagar now he is the vc probably at bhu so at bhu yes yes he is a wonderful person um mm. Guys, just have a conversation, probably. Sure, sure. Thank you. We'll we'll connect with him. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, with this, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Barun Majumdar and Dr. Shubhra Datta for their excellent presentations. They were really, really very good. Thanks to Dia for connecting with them. Thanks to Dr. Pani for arranging all this mm -hmm. and for inviting the participants. Thanks to our Vice President, Professor G. D. Sharma, sir. for joining and staying throughout the program and thanks to all the participants who are here and who i i am sure you must have really enjoyed the presentation it was very very informative and very very nice presentation thank you very much look forward to meeting all of you again tomorrow and in many more webinars which we will be holding in future over yes, to thank you thank you thank you madam thank you everyone okay. thank you thank everyone. you thank you everyone for being Thank you very much thank you <laughs>